Yeah, so we're going to switch gears now into electronics. Uh, first ILM is Rec Fires and Battery Chargers Part A. They did split it up into two modules. So we'll go through this first one here. I'll probably break this up into a couple lectures as well just because there's a lot of content. So I'm going to try and I think get at least through the first two objectives and then we'll make another video for the third uh, and final one for this ILM. So um, I'm going to kind of start with some of this stuff is potential review again. Um, it's always potential review unless we don't remember it then it seems like brand new information but uh, we have talked about some of this stuff especially in the AC we talked about it in second year so we're going to talk about effective and RMS values again but we also want to talk about DC. Okay so we did talk about DC in first year but uh, I'd say we've talked about it in, in machines as already as well in fourth year but um, we kind of want to make the distinction between the DC sine waves and some values we're going to get, or sorry, not DC sine wave, a DC voltage and current graph, if you will, and the difference between that and an AC uh, sine wave. So the first thing they want to, uh, what do we want to get into our terms are the, the biggest difference between DC and AC, obviously AC with our alternating so we're peaking to a maximum, then peaking to a negative uh, maximum. Our DC is a constant value. That's what we'd like to see anyways out of our DC. So direct current, it's not alternating back and forth. Okay, so it's only going in one direction. Now from a battery, we would see this constant DC output. So a nice straight line that if it's at 12 volts, it's at 12 volts. It doesn't matter where you pick on this line, it's going to be 12 volts. Okay, but we can get pulsating DC as well too, which we saw out of our DC generators, okay, and we can see that, uh, we'll see that again more here in um, rectification as well. So again, DC current only flows in one direction, voltage in which polarity does not change. Um, it can be constant or pulsating again, depending on what your DC supply is, but the current is always in the same direction. So the DC voltage is the same polarity over time, <coughs> okay. So different than what we talked about AC. So here's the DC generator we talked about, our output, even when we went from a full sine wave to commutation using split rings, we saw this pulsating DC where this was our uh, negative alternation until we used commutation, then it flipped it up here and gave us our, again, constant current going in the same direction, but it's now a pulsating DC output. So we can't really say, well, this value of DC right here is going to be the same as this, like we could if it was a straight line output. So we have to get a DC average. So there's going to be an average value across all this pulsating DC that's going to come out as a value, and we're going to call that our average DC. So the value of DC output is a mathematical average of all the instantaneous values recorded at even intervals over a period of time. For a constant DC, the output average would be equal to the instantaneous at any time. So that's that straight line. So again, if it's 12 volts, 12 volts everywhere. But for a pulsating DC, the average value is between the maximum and minimum instantaneous values. So our average is going to be somewhere between this maximum and this minimum value of DC voltage. Average values of DC are measured with a DC voltmeter. The meter automatically calculates and displays the average DC value. So measured DC values are always to be understood to be average unless otherwise stated. So if I put my meter up to this um, supply, it's going to give me a value of DC. It's not going to show me these pulsating peaks, and it's not going to go from 0 to 12, 0 to 12, and my meter's going to be flashing everywhere. Okay, It's just going to pick the DC average depending on what type of output it is, and that's what the meter's going to read. It's going to give me that DC average. And we'll be calculating these values in the next module. Um, alternating current, so then again this is a bit of review because we did talk about this in a second, where we do have the current reversing in direction. So we're peaking to a positive, then at our 180 we're peaking to our negative, and then back to zero for our full 360 degree alternation. So it also applies to a voltage that reverses polarity at periodic time intervals. Okay, So current and voltage follow this sine wave. Uh, the shape of the waveform is 
called a sine wave. So we have our positive alternation, our negative alternation. Together they make up one full cycle. Okay, So our period, again, is how long it takes to make that cycle. Okay, So however much time, usually again in milliseconds, it takes to go for a full 360 degree revolution. That's our period. And we can find our frequency once we know that as well, too. So the frequency of repetitive sine wave is the number of cycles that occur in one second measured in hertz. So the period can be calculated using the formula uh, T is equal to 1 over frequency, where T is the time and F is the frequency. So if we go 1 divided by, in this case, if it was 60, we get 0 0.0167 seconds or 16.7 milliseconds. That's how long it takes to, um, to, to have one cycle. Okay, and then we can basically rearrange the formula. If we found how long it takes to get through one cycle, we could find the frequency as well too. Okay, so just some terms that we want to revisit about our sine wave. Okay, so we have two alternations to make up one complete cycle. Then we can get our peak here, or max. So again, we have some synonymous terms. So V peak, uh, V P, or V max mean the same thing. That's the highest value of voltage. Again, if we're looking at a volt, volt sine wave here, that we're going to see. It's going to start at zero, peak to our max, then go down to zero, then peak again to our negative max, which will be the same value, just negative. And then we have the peak to peak value, which would basically be the peak doubled because it's going from peak to peak. So it would just be two times the peak to get that value. So it does talk about, again, in your module, it goes through RMS values um, or effective, okay, so effective or RMS values, uh, peak to peak values. Again, just it is basically the positive peak to the negative peak and instantaneous values. So we'll look at these instantaneous values here, and then we'll talk about RMS as well too. So for me, I like to talk RMS as an instantaneous value. Okay, our effective or RMS value is basically, at, it occurs at the sine of 45. So in your module, it even explains how they, how they figured that out, that at 45 degrees, that's gonna be my RMS value, and that's what my meter reads, okay? so. When we put our meter into an outlet, it's not reading the peak, it's not reading the zero, it's reading the effective or the RMS value, which is equivalent to an instantaneous value at 45 degrees. Now they figured that out based on the heating effect. They put a resistor in a DC circuit, it created a certain amount of heat. They put the same resistor into an AC circuit. When it produced the same amount of heat, that's what they labeled as the effective or the RMS value. Okay, and that happened at 45 degrees. So um, they do show you in the module too a different way of finding RMS. You can use the sine of 45, which is 0 0.707, or um, root two. Mathematically, it works out the same whether we multiply by 0 0.707 or divide by root two. You'll get the same answer, so do whichever one makes you more comfortable. Um, I use the sine of 45. So I'm just gonna switch over here to my camera for a second. So I can just do a couple of examples. All right, so I already got that going. Okay, so I just wanna talk about this RMS uh, instantaneous value scenario here. Okay, so we have our sine wave. And we have some values that we're going to be asked to calculate. Okay, again, my alternation. This is my peak, V peak. This is also my peak. And again, between the two of them, I would get a peak to peak. Okay, so at 90 here, 180, 270, 360. Okay, that's where I'm going to see those values. Again, um, my rough drawing here. So let's say I have a RMS, so what we're commonly reading, of 120 volts. Okay, and this question, you know, what question comes up and says, well, what's the 
instantaneous value of voltage at, let's say, at 10 degrees. Okay, so there's a formula we can use to find that out. But I also want to make a point to say that at 45 degrees here, this is where I'm going to see this value. Okay, so this is where I would see 120 volts right at that sign of 45. Okay, again, that says my RMS, or we call that effective as well. So what we need to do is be able to find the peak or the max. If I can find the max or the peak, I can find any value voltage um, at any instant on this sine wave. So the formula I like to use, again, I use it for instantaneous values, but can be used for RMS too, as long as we know that RMS and effective is also equal to the sine of 45. Okay, an instantaneous value at the sine of 45. So I take my formula of instantaneous value is equal to my max times the sine of theta. So again, this theta would be any angle that I want to find at any point in this graph. Well, in this question, they've given me, I, I want to find it at 10 degrees, but it's given me a value, an RMS value of 120 volts. So I need to find the max. So this 120 volts, knowing that my effective or RMS happens at the sign of 45, is basically saying this is my instantaneous value at 45 degrees. So if I wanted to fill in this information, my instantaneous value then becomes 120 volts is going to be equal to my max times the sign of 45 degrees. So if I want to rearrange my formula now to find out what the max is, I just go 120 volt divided by the sine of 45, and I'll get my max. So I go 120 divided by sine of 45, and I get 169.7 volts. So that is my max. Okay, so that's what this value is right here. So at 90 degrees, I have 169.7 volts. So that is my max, also called my peak. Okay, so now I have my max. Well, if I look back at this formula right here, if I have my max, I can times that by the sine of any angle and get an instantaneous value. So in this case, if I want it at 10 degrees, I just take my max times the sine of 10, and I'll get that instantaneous value. Okay, so if I want to know what it is here at 10 degrees, because that's what the question was originally asking, I just take my max, which is in my calculator already, or I can retype 169.7 times the sine of 10, and I get 29.5. Okay, so at 10 is equal to 29.5 volts. So that's what this value is right here, 29.5 volts. Okay, so that makes sense. If we're looking at this graph, this is going to be zero volts right here. As we get to 10 degrees, I'm at 29 and a half. At I get to 45, I'm at 120. And then at 90, I get 167 or 169.7. Then as I start going back down this way, I'm going to see those same values of voltage decreasing back to zero. So if I could find this point exactly on the other side of the graph here, Okay, and I can do that by knowing that there's a 45 degrees difference here. So I know that if I go to the 45 degree difference here, I'll get the same value of voltage. So I know that if I go to 135 here, I'll see the same value of voltage right here, the 120 volts that I see over on this side. Because this wave is still built up with the same values of voltage once we go from zero to peak or peak down to zero. Again, here I could say, because I know at 10 degrees it's 29.5, I also know at 170 degrees, it's also 29.5. And then the same thing would replicate down here. It's just that our peaks and all our values would be negative. Okay, and not that we don't have, not that we have less voltage, it's just that it's going in a different direction. Okay, that's what that negative is gonna mean. So again, once I find my max, the world is mine. I can find any instantaneous value on this sine wave. We're not always going to give you the max, so you might have to calculate and find that. 
So you will give you the values, either will give you an instantaneous value, uh, a value of voltage at a certain degree, or it'll say it's an RMS, and we just know that that happens at 45 degrees, okay, based on the heating effect again. Now what we can do is basically use 707, so we use 0 0.707 for a um, value, that is the sine of 45, okay? So we're either dividing by the sine of 45, which is 0 0.707 here, or the other option is to multiply by root two. Again, that's for your RMS, use that way if you like. Okay, but this should show you how you can find any value um, on any sine wave using this formula. Okay, and that's why I use it the most is because all I have to do then is remember that RMS is at the sine of 45, and I can just remember this formula, and, and I'll get everything right. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint here continue on. So again, this is kind of what these are showing here is my current this is using current instead of voltage, but again, it's same same deal. Okay, and I'm just going to go from currents. Oh, sh snap. Okay, so they're just saying, I, if I want to find these values at any of these instantaneous points, if I know the max, the value of the max, I can find any any value at any degree here. Okay, and those values will repeat where they're equal on the same alternation, and then they'll repeat again here, they'll just be negative. Because this peak is exactly the same as this peak. Okay, so there will be some questions on finding uh, instantaneous values, finding peak. This is important because when we get into a DC output, pulsating DC, it's the peak that we're going to use and the type of rectification that we're using that's going to determine the DC average output. So we have to have an understanding that if we're giving a value of RMS, we're going to have to get to peak before we start doing any calculations. Okay, so this is important to understand how we uh, manipulate the values and how we can get them uh, when giving other pieces of information. Um, next thing I talk about is just subscript uh, as far as um, your um, decimals go, going from milli to micro to nano to pico. Um, these ones we're more familiar with going for to kilo, okay, that we add three milli to negative three. We do get into this with our um, microfarads for our uh, capacitor values usually, okay, but just know how this chart goes uh, back and forth, okay, for our prefixes. Not our subscript, sorry, that's coming up right here. So if we need to know the polarity of the voltage across a resistor, we would use double script notation. Okay, so I can put a meter across here. This is a DC source, and I could read 30 volts here, 20 volts here. I would see that, okay? But what if I wanted to know what it was from B to C or C to B, okay? If it was positive or negative, because sometimes that's important, okay? Depending on how the supply is hooked up, or even just within reference to another point in the circuit. So again, the value across R1 could either be written as from reading from B to C or C to B. So we're just looking at this resistor right here. So B to C would be a positive 30 volts because B is positive. So here's the positive here. It's going to come and sit right here with respect to C because C is going to be more negative. So we're going to carry that negative all the way over here with respect to B. So if we're reading voltage B to C, it's going to be a positive voltage. In the same vein, this C is more negative with respect to B. So if we were reading from C to B, it would be a negative 30 volts. Okay, and I try to I put this in here to help me. I've hooked up a meter to a battery, and I've seen a negative voltage before. It says negative, you know, 13 volts, and I'm like, oh, I got my meter leads backwards. Then I switch them, and then it just says 13 volts. Okay, it's because you're reading it from the negative to positive instead of positive to negative. Okay, so that subscript is important because it tells us which, which basically side of this resistor is positive and which side is negative, just by telling us that this value is positive and then the subscript that's attached to it. Okay, so that's important when we're talking about our DC circuits as well, too. Um, last thing I talk about in the first, I think this is the end of the first exercise, is a voltage divider circuit. Okay, so 
normally what we've done, and you could still do this, is we would take, if we wanted to know the volt drop, cross here, cross here, cross here, cross here. We would know our source, we would get our total resistance. Then we could always get um, the current going through it because it's a series circuit. Then multiply the current by the resistance of each one of these and get the volt drop. And what they're saying is, is in series circuits, for a lot of DC circuits, uh, they will create these series circuits to split the voltages up to basically get a reduced voltage for different parts or components of the circuit. If they're in series, we can basically use a voltage divider rule knowing Kirchhoff's law that, you know, we're going to have the total amount of source voltage dropped across these four resistors. But if we can find the ratio between the resistance and the total resistance, we can apply that percentage to the voltage as well because they're directly related. Again, same currents going through all these. So basically what it's saying long and short is if I find the total kilowatts, so I add all these together, get my 10 kilowatts, I can find the percentage of this wattage to the total. So in this case, it's 40% of our total. This one would be 30% of our total. So three divided by the total, which is 10. 2 divided by 10, or 20%, or 1 divided by 10, 10% of our total. Now what I can do is take that voltage and multiply by these percentages, and I'll know the voltage across each one. So 40% of my voltage is going to go here. So I have 40 volts here, 30 volts here, 20 volts here, 10 volts here. And again, they still all have to add up to the source. So it's just a different way of finding volt drop across a specific piece of equipment or a component in a, in a DC circuit, we can use the voltage divider um, rule as opposed to just using Ohm's law and finding out that way. Okay, so don't get too lost on that. Uh, again, it's just basically a ratio, a percentage, the same percentage of resistance we're going to apply to the voltage and we'll have our volt drop. Okay, so just another way to find out those volt drops. Second objective <coughs> I'll get into here, there's metering. Okay, and we, I, again, I don't ever want to say that this is straightforward. Um, we use these meters a lot, but we don't always know exactly what we're doing or uh, why we're doing what we're doing. So an ohmmeter, okay, again, check for continuity, resistance, check for fuses, uh, windings. Okay, we can see if there's an open circuit or a short circuit using our ohmmeter. Again, we turn the power off to eliminate all parallel paths and to isolate the component. Touch the leads to verify the meter is working. Okay, it should read zero ohms. This is also if we had an audible, you would hear the beep or the ring. Okay, basically that means that it's a short circuit. You're touching the two leads together. It's like you have a path. So if you were testing continuity, you would, if the wire was whole, you would read zero ohms. OL is over limit, or what I like to think of as OL is going to read when you're trying to read the resistance of air. So your leads are not touching, and it indicates too low of a range or an open circuit. Okay, and then zero indicates a short circuit or a value below the limits of the meter. So again, we, we do this quite often, um, but these questions seem to get everybody. So when we touch the leads together, zero ohms. If we're touching, our, if we're trying to read like if a winding is good or a coil in a contactor, we would read an actual ohmic value, and then we would know that that coil was good. If we read OL when we're trying to check a coil, we know that the wire is broken, okay, because now we're trying to read the resistance of air. So it's definitely a huge uh, benefit with troubleshooting circuitry um, using our own meter, okay, I use it still quite a bit uh, in the field when I, uh, when I, when I actually do uh, electrical work. Your voltmeter, again, set, set the, select the appropriate range whether it's AC or DC, again, red positive, black negative, depending on, on the way we're reading that in our circuit, and high enough to read the expected voltage. So if I'm reading 600 volts, make sure I'm on a range that the meter's ready to uh, read that voltage. If not, it could damage the meter, okay? Also, voltmeters connected in parallel with the components. We say we're going across. I wanna read across a device, that's in parallel. Okay, or we think about sticking our meter to receive voltage, we put it in a um, duplex receptacle, we're going across it from hot to neutral, okay? Um, 
ammeter there's two types the clamp on and series clamp on again a lot easier for us we don't have to physically break the circuit um, it's basically like a CT like a current transformer there's a magnetic field that's developed around a conductor when it has current going through and that um, will that magnetic field will cause a current in the meter and it will show us uh, what current is flowing through there huge advantage where I don't have to break the circuit I can just clamp it I just, obviously to read current we want to be in series but this allows us to not break it again if you were trying to find the, the uh, current of a panel of a feeder you'd have to disconnect that feeder put the meter in series so you're shutting down the whole the whole panel to do that okay this we can just clamp on one and we are uh, good to go so again it's like a CT where the primary uh, is the wire the clamp is the secondary meter detects the magnetic field clamp on meters are not accurate below the 100 milliamp range because the magnetic field is too small so we have to use a series meter in that case but only one conductor is clamped otherwise the magnetic fields would cancel each other out giving a reading of zero so you only clamp one line at a time if you clamp them both it would read zero even though there is current definitely going through those uh, series meters require wiring to be disconnected so again we actually have to wire this in does you know have its place again for those small current ranges we would still use a series connected meter okay um, again series the difference between series and parallel okay we just want to make sure current we're in series voltmeters we're in parallel multimeters okay this is kind of an old bench style multimeter but most of our meters the fluke meters that we have are multimeters they do all of the functions current dc current dc voltage ac voltage ac current and resistance okay our handheld meters do that as well we select the range um, accordingly and away we go uh, one new piece that we're going to talk about here now that we're dealing with these electronic circuits is an oscilloscope so we will be hooking these up in class as well too and we will um, go through these functions in lab as well too just so you guys know but voltmeters and ammeters cannot measure a moment in time so like a sine wave right which again we're saying was like you know 17 milliseconds a, a cycle well these um, meters can do that okay they can actually let us look at the sine wave whether it's AC DC whatever it is and it does it based on voltage and time so our voltage is in divisions up this way and our time is in divisions this way so just like our our period how long is this taking to for the cycle to repeat and then our volts per division is going to give us our maximum value of voltage okay so whatever the divisions are you can literally just count them and you'll know the peak here okay and same with the time you can count how many divisions it takes for a full cycle to be complete then you multiply whatever setting it's on and you can get your frequency okay uh, again vertical axis is voltage horizontal is time um, applications include include measurement of harmonic ground fault test circuit instrument signals okay so we can use these for quite a few different applications again the volts per division depending on what your setting is set at some of the scopes and ours will show peak to peak rms okay but we can actually just choose a setting that shows the entire cycle and literally count those those uh peak or those uh divisions and then know how much uh, the value of, of voltage is uh, they you can have two or more voltages displayed at the same time as we have various channels on the scopes as well too so um, what it's saying here though is if we have AC and DC it kind of changes our reference if we want to show both at the same time that's what these numbers are saying is that basically if we put a 10 volt level DC uh, on here and then we have an AC as well it's going to change the reference from zero and it's going to show that AC kind of riding on that DC 10 volts here so that's why our one volt RMS so 2.8 volt peak to peak is being shown here at the 10 instead of at the zero okay but you might want to compare the DC to the AC in the circuit and that the scope would allow us to do that as well time based control again we can find out our frequency it's the horizontal portion of that graph we can pick any type of uh, scales uh, from 10 milliseconds 50 millisecond again you're just going to want to make sure that you can see the full cycle to get an accurate reading on that 
Um, AC ground DC, so in the AC coupled mode, any DC component of the circuit is rejected or blocked. Okay, it adds a capacitor in series, so it just kind of charges it up there and doesn't, doesn't let it go through. The DC couple mode shows AC and DC together. Okay, this is a significant concept here that there's tons of questions on. So which mode can you see AC and DC? The DC couple mode shows both, okay? So, and then the ground position will show uh, zero volts reference on the screen. Okay, but watch this here. This is where we're gonna say, we're gonna ask you a ton of questions on that. So make sure you got that dialed. Trigger controls, and we can get a pulsating or kind of like a moving wave across the screen. We can use our trigger controls to help stabilize that repetitive uh, waveform. Um, it kind of almost basically stops it from moving, so then we can actually take accurate readings on it. Okay, and we'll show all this in lab as well too. Connecting the oscilloscope, again, it is voltage, so we're gonna go across the load, okay, just like a voltmeter you would. Um, again, with respect to a specific point. So in this case, they're saying we're measuring between A and R. So if polarity is critical and double scripts are used, the scope is connected to the first letter and the reference lead, so you can see it's attached to here, but this is our reference lead, is connected to the second one. So in the figure below, the voltage waveform would be A with respect to R, because it would be, uh, it'd be labeled VAR, because again, my reference is the second one, and my, um, for, or my main lead is going right to the uh, first letter. So it shows me that I'm reading from A to R. Okay, and again, it depends. You'll get a different value based on that uh, if you change your reference point. Uh, in AC bench powered type scopes, reference lead is grounded and bonded to the chassis. If the circuit under test is also grounded, you can attach the reference lead to only that part which is grounded. So it does show us here too that in this scenario here, it's incorrect because what we've done is we've attach this grounded reference lead to line one, which is our ungrounded circuit. So that creates a short. So we wouldn't want that. You would either want to connect it to L2, so switch these leads around, or what they say is we can use an isolating transformer where we don't have L2 um, as the grounded conductor. So then we can put the lead wherever we like. This would be ideal because then we're not limited to what we can read as far as uh, subscript and which voltage we can read. Um, this is going to allow us to read everything, uh, anything we want. And that's all done through this isolating transformer because we don't have this grounded point anymore for that short circuit to happen. So this is how it's done in our lab too. Okay, so then the next uh, objective, we're going to get into some semiconductor theory. So I'm back to right down to uh, the uh, valence electrons and the difference between insulators, conductors, and semiconductors.